era un joven sin familia, al que miles le festejaban sus videos, videos degradantes, en los que aparecía alcoholizado hasta la inconsciencia. Este joven sin familia y ansioso por agradar, se dedicó a subir videos donde aparecía alcoholizado y drogado. Juan Luis Lagina Rosales was living a life at 17 that most people could only dream of. Money, luxury, and a diehard fan following. He had everything under his belt, but his lavish life was cut short due to one small mistake. He messed with a Mexican cartel. So, what did he do to enrage a narco lord? Was it enough for him to take his life? Could it have been avoided? Join us as we discover the answers to these questions and uncover other details of this sensational case. This is the story of the famous teen YouTuber who lost his life after swearing at a narco lord. Juan Luis Lagina Rosales was born in Sinaloa, Mexico. Unlike other children of his age, Juan had a dysfunctional family which had a deep impact on his mind. He didn't know his father, and his mother abandoned him in his childhood. His grandmother raised him and tried to provide necessities as much as she could, but she could never replace the parents' love. As a result, Juan soon turned unruly and began challenging the conventional way of life. At 15, Juan did the unthinkable and ran away from home. He ended up in Culiacán, where he decided to rebuild his life from scratch. He started washing people's cars for a living. Around that time, he also developed the habit of drinking. The new town suited him well, and he became comfortable living there. One day, he was hanging out with a few friends when he decided to take a bottle of alcohol and drink from it directly. He had chugged a large portion of the alcohol, and after a while, he began to sway and tumble against a pillar. Soon, he passed out on the ground. One of his friends captured the video and posted it on the internet. The absurdity of the content made him famous instantly. Juan started loving all the attention and decided to become an online celebrity. He would often post himself partying with his friends and drinking heavily. The nature of the content was still absurd and immature, and he created them just for likes and laughs. People soon began calling him El Pirata de Culiacán, or the Pirate of Culiacán, and his social media following grew rapidly. By the time he turned 17, he had hundreds of thousands of followers on his Instagram and over a million followers on his Facebook. The official drinking age in Mexico is 18, but Juan didn't care about the age limit. He also tried to appear older in his pictures by adding tattoos on his arms and drawing a beard on his face. He also posted pictures with half-naked women, high-caliber weapons, and luxury cars. José Luis Lagunas se hizo famoso en redes sociales por aparecer en videos y fotografías alcoholizado en compañía de mujeres o portando armas de agro a su calibre. He became an overnight influencer as brands and TV shows began working with him in music videos and promotional events. Amongst all this, he continued drinking in all his videos to keep his social media followers entertained. In the summer of 2017, Juan Luis was arrested for underage drinking, but was only held for a short while before he was released. He appeared in a radio interview and told the host that he was having problems with alcohol addictions. He admitted that he sometimes would go too far, but somehow, he was also self-assured. He said, no mames, el pirata tiene como 17 y ya es alcohólico. Le van a ir dando cirrosis a ese men. Capitos. Pues, tener razón a la gente también. Perfect. Some blamed him for promoting alcoholism and substance abuse among young people. Others warned him of the dangers of living in Sinaloa, a state plagued by violence and drug trafficking. However, Juan also said that he understood that the drinking might be taking a toll on his health and public image, and he admitted that he was trying to quit or reduce alcohol consumption so that he could pursue his music career. He had recently signed a contract with a record label. However, he never got to the point of having a normal life or career. In December 2017, Juan was recording one of his usual videos while drunk, but this time, he did something extremely stupid. He insulted the kingpin of the notorious CJNG, or the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, Nemesio Oseguera Cervantes, or El Mencho. The CJNG is one of the deadliest narcotics cartels in the world. They originated in Mexico, deal with substances and violence, and are considered one of the most brutal and merciless organized criminals in the world. They began as a splinter group of the Milenio Cartel. Under El Mencho's reign, the CJNG has committed some of the most gruesome crimes that have shaken the whole world. CJNG has always been well known 
for its organized strategies and tactics. Even in a state of panic, their approach is extremely thought out. They use advanced weapons and know how to fight with a cool head, even in the most dire situations. They have a very intelligent strategy, which is basically branding themselves and looking like paramilitary power. Branded uniforms, advanced weaponry, and handmade tanks and vehicles. The CJNG ensured that they created and maintained an intimidating appearance to dominate their victims and rival cartels. They are also majorly responsible for the narcotics influx into the United States. The DEA says his cartel, called Cartel Jalisco or CJNG, is responsible for roughly a third of the drugs entering this country by land and by sea. Not only that, the CJNG is well known for its violence and acts of inhuman brutality. Whenever police attempted to stop them or arrest one of their people, they would light cities on fire create roadblocks by burning vehicles and fire at locals and police officers until their demands were met. The Jalisco New Generation Cartel took the fight to the next level, shooting down a military helicopter, helicopter with a rocket-propelled grenade. The reason? Just to have chances of better negotiation with the government. And all that violence is only to have leverage in the negotiations with the um, government, with politicians, right? They create these chaos. To, to, to go and sit with a local politician and say like, okay, do you want more or shall we negotiate this? They also maintained dominance over multiple territories where they processed and trafficked narcotics, threatened the locals, and collected extortion money from the businesses. They have the control of Jalisco, Michoacán, Guerrero, even Veracruz, which is a state on the complete opposite side of the country. Not only this, in 2011, the CJNG slaughtered 35 men and women piled their bodies up in trucks and dumped them at a place in the city of Veracruz. Onlookers watched on as the gang very casually left the semi-naked bodies on the street, as if their lives never really mattered. 35 bodies dumped underneath a bridge in eastern Mexico. Veracruz was a quiet port city. Now dead men and women are dumped near shopping centers. This incident of massacre in Veracruz is still one of the most brutal acts undertaken by narcotics cartels and is still widely spoken about all around the world. Disturbed by the activities of this cartel, the DEA offered a million-dollar bounty on the CJNG kingpin, El Mencho. Tonight, the DEA is offering $10 million for information leading to the arrest of the Mexican drug kingpin known as El Mencho. The Mexican government also offered a bounty of around $1.5 million for his arrest. Ironically, before he became a crime boss, El Mencho was a police officer and worked in the force for quite some time. He also lived in the U.S. for a few years before he was arrested for narcotics charges in San Francisco and deported back to Mexico. He then started eliminating people in both the U.S. and Mexico. He had zero remorse for what he did, and he never valued the lives of other human beings. He's the one that's responsible for sending the and that's actually killing innocent women and kids. And so what happens when someone's child dies, you know, good chance it probably came from this organization. So when Juan insulted him in one of his videos, he warranted his demise. In the video, Juan told El Mencho, El Mencho Juan had already established a goofy and funny persona online that bordered craziness, and all of it was lighthearted fun. Sadly, El Mencho didn't think his video was humorous, and he decided to teach him a lesson. Weeks after posting this video, Juan continued posting his regular content, many of which were live and posted from the spot he was at. This was another mistake, as it gave the cartel members enough information to track down his whereabouts. But being attacked was the last thing on Juan's mind. Otherwise, he would maintain caution. On Monday, December 18th, 2017, he posted on social media, telling his followers that would be at the bar called Menta 2 Cantaros in Zapopan in Jalisco, and that they should meet him there for some drinks. At around 11 in the evening, a group of four men stormed into the bar and opened fire at a table where the 17-year-old was sitting. They riddled his body with at least 15 bullets. The youngster died on the spot. As soon as the deed was done, the attackers fled the scene without being identified or captured. Authorities could only identify Juan through his tattoos. A 25-year-old bartender was also wounded amid the frenzy. Officers took him to the hospital, where he passed away the following day. And this is how the torrid life of a teen superstar came to a shocking end. This is not the first time Mexico has lost a harmless young content creator just because he ruffled the feathers of a cartel kingpin. In February 2018, 
Popular YouTuber and satirist Leslie Ann Pamela Montenegro was brutally unalived because of her objectionable content. She jabbed narco lords and top politicians on her YouTube channel, especially the ones in Acapulco and Guerrero. In Acapulco, fue asesinada la youtuber Leslie Ann Pamela Montenegro, conocida como Nana Pelucas. Anoche dos hombres le dispararon en su restaurante en el fraccionamiento Costa Azul. Her satirical magazine and YouTube show, called El Sillón, or The Couch, was popular among Mexicans. She played a character in her YouTube show called La Nana Pelucas, or The Grandma in Wigs. She wore a bushy wig and large glasses and spoke in a high-pitched, sarcastic voice to entertain her viewers. But why was her content considered controversial? Well, in one of her videos, Leslie commented about the Acapulco mayor, saying, this snot face didn't even have enough support for re-election, and now he thinks he'll become a senator. Leslie and her husband ran her satire magazine and YouTube channel together, and also owned a restaurant called A Todos Los Santos. At around six in the evening, two men entered the restaurant and approached Leslie, who was sitting with her husband. They opened fire at them and quickly left the scene. She received deep wounds on her face and neck and passed away. Her fans were left shocked, and the incident pushed her husband into grief. Investigation began, and soon, Attorney General of Guerrero, Javier Olea, claimed that Leslie had sensitive information about a notable narcotics cartel, which she was planning to leak in one of her videos. When the cartel knew about it, they assassinated her. But which cartel was responsible for it? He pointed his fingers at a local up-and-coming cartel called the Independent Acapulco Cartel and claimed that it was behind the attack by orders from their leader, Javi Daniel Cervantes Magno. However, people soon despised Olea when he didn't arrest Magno or any other cartel member. It led many to believe that the top politicians of Mexico were responsible for removing Leslie from the scene because they couldn't take her criticism. Even Leslie's husband, Samuel Munizuri, claimed the same. But the case has been pending ever since, with no information on who did it. Guerrero, el esposo de Pamela Montenegro, la bloguera conocida como Nana Pelucas, quien fue asesinada hace unos días en Acapulco, exigió justicia y pidió a la fiscalía que se deslinde del caso de cualquier vínculo con la delincuencia organizada. He strongly claimed that it was a hate crime, but no one seemed to pay heed. He said, the attorney general is exercising gender violence because he is criminalizing her. She only did political satire. It's just not valid that now they're trying to make her out to be a delinquent. This was a hate crime, a political crime. It had nothing to do with organized crime. Since then, Leslie's fans could only hope that she found justice. Not only Leslie, but content creators and artists in Mexico have always been under immense pressure to check their content in fear of angering narcotics cartel leaders or powerful people. While many adhere to the warnings, a few show the courage to speak the truth, but it almost always ends in a tragedy for them. Following Leslie's demise in 2018, a journalist named Nevith Condes Jaramillo lost his life in 2019. He was knifed near his house. He ran a show called Frente al Sur, which collected complaints from the public and exposed politicians and local corruption by government employees and businesses owned by cartels. He had already received death threats for encouraging people to come forward with the truth. When he didn't listen to the warnings, cartel members silenced him for good. A report claimed that around 157 journalists had lost their lives between 2020 and 2022. The number is shocking and demands urgent investigation. But will Mexico take this step? In 2022, Another YouTuber called El Compa Jorge was gunned down outside his house in Culiacan, Sinaloa, as he came out to go to work. According to some of his videos, he was abducted by cartels in 2021, but he hadn't reported the crime back then. For reasons unknown, he decided to videotape the location of the abduction and retell the details of the incident with his online followers. This careless act attracted the attention of the cartel members and ended in a tragedy. Jorge was only 36 years old and had his whole life lying ahead of him. On the day of the incident, he was on his way to work and posted content online speaking about his latest achievements and plans for his career. An SUV drove up to him and one of the two men sitting inside fired at him 10 times and then they left the same way they had come. Jorge was immediately taken to the hospital, but he passed away on the way. An investigation later revealed that the SUV didn't even have a Sinaloa license plate and hence could not be identified. His fans were devastated by the loss, but they also criticized his decision to go back and film the location and divulge details about the cartel in his video. No one knows if he did it for the clout or out of plain immaturity. His YouTube channel did get a boost, but he lost his life in the process.
YouTubers aside, famous artists and singers also aren't safe from these cartels. Many singers popular in the narco corrido genre have been mercilessly eliminated because of their possible links with narcotics cartels. Sometimes they were unalived, simply because they had offensive lyrics in their songs. So, what is a narco corrido song? It's usually a ballad written for cartel kingpins to praise their achievements or highlight their lifestyle. Sometimes the artists create them on their own, and sometimes the cartel leaders pay them to write and sing those songs to immortalize themselves. But how can it be harmful to the singers? Well, in a country where rival cartels are at war with each other, singing someone's praise can undoubtedly offend another cartel leader. The singer then becomes the target of these cartels and is soon eliminated. Perhaps the most bone-chilling incident is of Rosalino Chalino Sanchez. He was a popular narco corrido singer. On May 15, 1992, he was performing on the stage when someone in the audience handed him a piece of paper. It was a threat for him and said that he would be dead if he continued to sing. His expression changed immediately as he understood what was about to happen to him, but he quickly wiped his sweat off, replaced it with a smile, and began performing once again. It became the best performance of his life. After the show, he was abducted. On May 16, 1992, at sunrise, farmers found Chalino's body in a shocking state by an irrigation canal near the highway, north out of town. His eyes were blindfolded, and his wrists had marks of being tied. There were two bullet wounds at the back of his head. It's speculated that Chalino was eliminated by Gonzalo Araujo Payan, a Sinaloa cartel sicario nicknamed El Chalo. Reportedly, he also had influences in the government and law enforcement agencies of the country, so he feared no one. Many speculate that El Chalo accepted the assignment because Chalino was stubborn in his ways, and he wanted to break his pride. He even tried to humiliate the singer before he took his life and asked him to kneel before him. But reportedly, Chalino didn't budge. El Chalo didn't wait before claiming his life. Another popular narco corrido singer with an international career was eliminated because of his songs. His name was Jose Sergio Vega Cumea, and he earned his name and fame through Mexican regional music before branching into narco corrido music. Sergio Vega and his brothers created a band called Los Hermanos Vega in 1989 in Phoenix, Arizona. After having a fallout with his brothers and due to poor mental health, he came back to his roots, revamped his music career, and began singing once again. However, this time, he became interested in narco corrido music. It was an extremely risky business, but equally profitable, because he was earning good money. Despite witnessing Chilino's death, Sergio Vega continued to sing songs praising narco lords. When many of these singers disappeared by 2010, the government put a bar on the production and distribution of narco corrido music, but their efforts remained futile. The songs were vastly popular, and restrictions couldn't dilute their popularity. In June 2010, someone spread a rumor that Sergio Vega had been eliminated, but he appeared in an interview with an entertainment magazine and announced that he was very much alive and that the false allegations were causing trouble for his family. It has happened to me for years now. Someone tells a radio station or a newspaper I have been killed or suffered an accident, and then I have to call my dear mother, who has heart trouble, to reassure her. But his words couldn't remain true for long. On June 26th, he was on his way to perform in a concert in Sinaloa. Sergio Vega was traveling on the Mexico Nogales International Highway in his red Cadillac. He suddenly noticed that a car was following him. Sergio Vega called his agent immediately and informed her that he was being followed and the incident was unsettling him. He asked her to inform the federal police. The agent heard gunfire through the call before Sergio told her that he feared he wasn't going to make it. And then everything fell silent. Many tied his demise to the kingpin of the Beltran Leva organization, Hector Beltran Leva. In 2020, his financial operator was arrested, and he divulged that Hector and Sergio Vega had a romantic relationship, but the claim was never proven. Rumors said that Hector was upset and angry when Sergio decided to play at a concert for a rival narco lord, so he hired an assassinator and eliminated Sergio. The other singers who lost their lives in the hands of cartels are Valentin Elizalde, members of Tecnobanda Fuga's band, the beautiful and talented Zaida Peña Arjona, and Grammy-nominated singer Sergio Gomez of Capaz de la Sierra. After Juan's demise, speculation said that El Mencho was behind this attack. However, the attackers were unidentified, so no arrest was made. But even if they could identify them, which cartel member would they arrest? And even if they did, could they keep him in prison for long knowing how violent the cartel got whenever a man from their ranks was arrested? Unfortunately, Juan never got justice. What's worse is that the once popular teen star never got a proper goodbye after his demise. 
According to netizens, despite having so many friends when he was alive, Juan didn't have one single person who came to claim his body after his demise. He didn't even get a funeral. Juan's friend Beto Sierra is another Instagram star. He remembered his friend as a fun-loving, cheerful, and positive individual. He even mentioned that Juan wanted to make his life better. He told me that he wanted to change, but on the weekends, there was no lack of bad influences. You were living a fast life. You never listened, and I don't judge you. Those who knew, you know, you were a good person. An artist called Luis Adame of Ultimo Esquadron had featured Juan in his videos and was deeply saddened by his passing. There are a lot of people who criticize him, but the truth is, that's why El Pirata got started. Everyone in their own way tries to find a way to get ahead. Many reporters also criticized his ways of living after his demise and mentioned that his alcoholism and desire for fame had pushed him over the edge. A report made by Univision said he opted to make a career as a broken toy of cyberspace, a path he carved out drink by drink, and that left him with enemies of flesh and blood. Juan's assassination is not only a message to the general public to not cross the paths of the cartel kingpins, but also a wake-up call for authorities and law enforcement agencies. It goes to show that the cartels are taking the lives of innocent people over the smallest and most insignificant issues. If the practice keeps up, soon people in Mexico will lose the right to freedom of speech and journalism, and content creation in the country will die a slow and painful death. Do you think the law enforcement is doing enough to bring Juan justice? Do you think being a content creator is safe in areas ruled by cartels? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching the video. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel.